Well, now that I've taken limit, so if I was to ask how do you find the limit, you would say I would plug in numbers. How would a limit exist? Well, if the limit from the left equal the limit from the right. Don't forget there are one-sided limits. So those, you don't have to take both sides. If you're looking for a one-sided limit, you know, example, the limit is x approaches a from the right of f of x, you only pick problem numbers from the right. Now here we're going to loosen that definition a bit and start using a shortcut. So we define finding a limit by plugging numbers. That's how you find the limit. Everything we're going to talk about now is a faster way of finding the limit. Suppose we have two limits and they exist at some value a. And suppose that c is a constant. If I take the limit of the sum, that's the sum of the limits. If I take the limit of the difference, that's the difference of the limits. If I take the limit of a function times a constant, I drag the constant up front and take the limit of the function. If I'm taking the limit of two functions multiplied, I'll take the limit of each and multiply the result. So pretty much it's safe to switch the wording on any limit. Limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided the denominator, that limit does not equal zero. The limit of a power function is the power function of the limits. Now, limit of a constant, if I'm looking at f of x equal a constant c, no matter where a is, the limit from the left and the limit from the right will always be c. And the limit of y equal x since y equal x if x is a then y would be a from the left and the right so it's kind of a constant is a special case but here you could substitute in and the limit of a power function you plug in the a in there and that's what you get same thing with a radical and the limit of the nth root of the function is the nth root of the limit of the function. So find the indicated limits. This is going to be a 4. Why is that? That's a constant. And just for your notes, I would say that's by 7. And what's the limit this x approaches 2? Well, you plug in 2, that is 2. That is by uh, 8. Now, we're going to practice this a bit. And this is the only place in the book where you kind of have to justify what you're doing. So this is, I'm going to write the steps. And you have homework like that you're going to have to figure out the steps that's on the exam you're not expected to memorize those by numbers that is so this is by what allows you limit of the product is the product of the limits that's by 4 So this is the only place in the homework. I think you have a couple of problems like that. Where you just have to state by 4. Now if I take that first one. That's the limit as x approaches 1 of x cubed. Minus the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x. What allows you to say the limit of the difference is the difference of the limit, that is, by 2. Again, on a test, you wouldn't be asked for this because I don't expect you to memorize those by number. But it's a very good practice to understand how this works. This is by 1 and this is by 1 limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Now here I would say this is 1 cubed minus 
twice the limit as x after judgment of x. Again, if you want to be really picky, the substitution is 9. And is it 3? Three? 3 is factoring the constant out. Here I would say that is 1 to the 4th by 9. This is 3 times the limit as x after judgment of x. That is by 3. And limit of a constant is the constant that is by 7. Almost done. So this is 1 minus twice. You plug 1 in, that's by 9. Actually, that is by, you can think of it as 9 or 8. It's really 8 because it's x. one plus three times you plug in one you get one that's by eight plus one and you end up with one minus two which is a negative one times three for five you end up with a negative five so on the homework you're going to have to kind of justify it on a test if this comes up you just say it's the product you really don't have to specify now there's a shortcut you really want to go over so, how do you find the limit? You plug in numbers. How would the limit exist if the limit from the left before the limit from the right, unless it's a single-sided limit? How would a limit not exist if a limit from the left doesn't equal the limit from the right? So, rule of thumb, this is a shortcut applying if f if f is a rational function, a polynomial, a radical or trigonometric function where they're defined, then if you take in the limit of that f and happen to be one of those, where did the 1 come from? You throw the a in. If you get a value, again, if it's only one of those four, you're done. If you get a number over zero, that means the limit doesn't exist. The answer would be either positive infinity or negative infinity. And if you look at zero over zero, that's the majority of the time, you're going to simplify. If it's a radical, if it's a rational, if it's a complex fraction or trig, I'll point that out. Note, if the limit gives you 1 over 0, that's plus or minus infinity. And if the limit gives you 1 over plus or minus infinity, that's normally a 0. I'll point that out as we play along. So here, actually, let's talk about that really quick. If I take 1 over, the limit as x approaches 0, if I put a number very close to 0, do you see what's going to happen to the top? That's going to blow out of proportion. That's going to be 10,000. And if I'm looking at a value in which the denominator is getting very big, 1 over a very large number is going to approach 0. So this is only in terms of limits. Well, let's start. I have a few examples. So this shortcut is a must, but it's a shortcut. Remember that. Evaluate the limit if it exists. Well, the shortest way, instead of plugging numbers in this and throw a negative 1 in, you get 1 minus 1, which is 0 over. You get 1 minus 3 plus 2, which is 0. That means you need to manipulate this. Well, rationals are easy to manipulate. Why is that? Well, you factor the top and you factor the bottom. This is really what you're doing. You're trying to cancel the 0 over 0 part. Now, 0 over 0 is undefined, but since I'm taking the limit and x can never ever be a negative 1, you're getting around the system. Once you cancel something out, you restart that shortcut. You plug in negative 1 again. And what does that give you? A negative 1 over 1, which is negative 1. Now, if you were to plug numbers in, limit from the left, limit from the right, you will get a negative 1. How about here, if I throw a negative 1 in, negative 1 plus 2 is a 1, 
over 1 minus 3. That is a 1 over a negative 2. That's negative 1 half. Done. So, rule of thumb, you plug the value in if you have a rational. This is a rational fraction. All of these different combinations, radicals. How about here? If I throw 0 in, I'll get 1 minus 1. That's a 0 over 0. So, I'm going to take the limit as h of which is 0. Now, I'm going to manipulate the problem. 1 plus 2h plus h squared minus 1. That is the limit as h of which is 0. Factor an h out. And once you cancel the factor, you restart. Throw zero in, and what do you get? And that would be my limit. So, that's a big jump. How about here? 3 and 3 plus 1 is 4 squared. Of course, 2 minus 2, that's a 0 over 0. Well, there's one thing you could do with radicals, and that makes them very easy to get around. If you see a radical and you end up with a 0 over 0, then guess what? There's one way of proceeding. You multiply by the conjugate. The same exact radical the same exact quantity make sure that those have opposite signs you're guaranteed that the top will become the first squared which is y plus 1 minus the second squared which is a 4 the denominator no need to distribute because I want to get rid of that 0 So this is going to be the limit as y of which is 3y plus 1 minus 4 is minus 3. And what do you notice happens? Those cancel out. Once I cancel something out, then what? I would plug the 0 in, I'll get 1 over 1. the square root of 1 plus 2, that is 1 third. Now, if you have time, take a calculator out, make a table, and plug in numbers to the left of 0, the 3, and to the right, and guess what you're going to get? How about here? Negative 2. That's 4 plus 5. That's... Uh, that wasn't intended. I'm going to fix that. A negative 2. That's 9. 4 plus 5. 9. Square root of 9 is 3 minus 3. That is 0 over 0. Well, what does that mean? You can rationalize. The square root of x squared plus 5 plus 3. So I'm going to get the limit as x of which is negative 2. The denominator I just copy and drag along. As for the top, the first squared is x squared plus 5 minus the second squared which is a 9. And that would be x squared minus 4. Again, no need to multiply the denominator. You need to get rid of that original 0. So this is the limit as x of which is negative 2 of x minus 2 into x plus 2. And once these cancel out,
you throw that value in again, the top will be negative 2 minus 2, 4 plus 5 plus 3, 3, that would be a negative 4 over square root of minus 3 plus 3 is a 6. That's negative 2 thirds.